one was settled. This is the house of David Deerdorf, came here in 1798 with his father, Abram. The other created. Columbus was created by the state legislature on a narrow vote. And ever since then, it had been looking over its shoulder as if it was afraid somebody was following it. Both are tied together. Columbus was founded by people from Franklinton. And the river that ran between them defined them both. And it challenged Columbus to become the most beautiful and well-ordered state capital in the country. We are, as we have always been, a crossroads, a place where the widest variety of people come together, work together, live together, and generally do a pretty good job of doing just that. Franklinton and downtown Columbus, next on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... Since 1921, the State Auto Group is called Columbus Neighborhoods Home, offering personal and business insurance through independent insurance agents. For your car, home, and business, the State Auto Group. As we've grown and changed with Columbus, we've never lost sight of one thing. We are neighbors serving neighbors. Chase and its more than 15,000 Central Ohio associates are proud to celebrate the historic neighborhoods of Columbus. AEP Ohio, connected to your life. More at aepohio.com. The law firm of Bailey Cavalieri, a local firm with a national presence, baileycavalieri.com. And by these and other local foundations and families, and viewers like you, thank you. If you were one of the early pioneers in Franklinton, you were probably welcomed here by Lucas Sullivan. A surveyor from Virginia, he was given land as payment. He chose a spot along a fertile low point at the confluence of the Scioto and Olentangy Rivers. In a recorded history, uh, we have Lucas Sullivan calling it the bottoms because it's bottom land. Uh, floods periodically, which can be good and bad, and it was uh, good farmland. Sullivan named his settlement Franklinton, after Benjamin Franklin. Sullivan was a lot like Franklin because his interests, well, there were many. He built the first jail, he built the first courthouse, he built the first and the second church, he had a mill, he had a store, he built the first brick house in Franklin County. Whatever was needed, it was just, he was the kind of man that says, okay, we need this, let's do it. Sullivan wanted neighbors, so he gave away plots of his land. Franklinton has a long history of being um, a primary settling place for a lot of rural and Appalachian families moving up from West Virginia, Southern Ohio, Northern Kentucky. Those families have been relatively stable. We have families who've been here for four and five generations now. If you came, you too could build a home on Gift Street. This is the house of David Deerdorf. Came here in 1798 with his father, Abram. Abram dropped him off and said, son, he's 13 years old. Let's plant some corn. So he planted 10 acres of corn, supposedly over here by the uh, Veterans Memorial. 
and uh, there was maybe something like 18 people here at the time. To make it through the winter, you'd need a broad axe to fell trees for a cabin. For goods, you might trade with the Native American tribes. In exchange for deer hides, you would bring nails. Bells were particularly popular. There were times of violence, as white settlers claimed more and more native land. But there were peaceful times, too. Uh, I sometimes think to that period of time and say, you know, there's a time when we had Native Americans, we had white settlers, and we had a black child and family all living in peace for a while. And I thought, gee whiz, that's certainly an admirable, admirable time and environment that we all ought to strive to get back to. The black child was an orphan. His name was Arthur Boak Jr. Sullivan's wife, Sarah, adopted him. Uh, he was the same age as Sarah's firstborn, William. And so the story goes that she took him into the home and nursed him. She was the white woman nursing the black baby, which usually it's the other way around. But I, I've always respected the, the memory of Lucas Sullivan when I think of the, uh, the courage that he had to possess in coming into what was at the time a wilderness. Uh, also his uh, perseverance, his, his staying power, if you will and also um, a, uh, a matter of compassion that I think he and his family showed. Columbus is an invented city. It was chosen to be the state capital of Ohio after years of political wrangling and backroom deals, the details of which are staggering. What you need to know is that the stakes were high. Every city wanted the economic boon of having the capital in its midst. And Lucas Sullivan was a prominent figure in the deal. Four men called proprietors, really developers, had come together and offered a package. 10 acres for a state house, 10 acres for a penitentiary, $50,000, an immense sum of money at that time, to build buildings as well. One of those four proprietors was Lyon Starling, the brother-in-law of Lucas Sullivan. Columbus was founded by people from Franklinton, and the businesses in Columbus were founded by people from Franklinton. So it was a very intimate relationship. There wasn't a lot of hostility in it, and the flooding issue was one that they knew no one was going to locate a capital here, but it's right across the river. Hey, that's close enough. People from the north settled in Worthington. People from the south settled in Franklinton. As for Columbus, well, it was in between. The place for the cross of culture between north and south becomes the new capital city of Columbus. Being a created city was perhaps an advantage. It allowed for the widest number of people from all walks of life to live together. Still, creating a city from scratch does have a few disadvantages, probably best summed up over a century later by hometown hero James Thurber. He wrote once that uh, Columbus was created by the state legislature on a narrow vote. And ever since then, it had been looking over its shoulder as if it was afraid somebody was following it. So it was kind of this theme of insecurity. It took a few years to start the business of building Columbus. The War of 1812 took precedence. Franklinton served as one of General William Henry Harrison's army encampments. Four years after the war, the economy recovered enough to start building the new capital of Columbus. But what to build first? 
the whole idea behind the capital city is to meet the needs of Ohio General Assembly when it's in session. So essentially, how do you meet those folks' needs? You meet them with hotels and restaurants. There's a public market. By the 1820s, you have a theater located in the town. Eventually, you're going to see the first bookstore. We need to remember that Columbus is a pretty small town. As late as the early 1830s, it's still a population of around 2,000 people or so. It's not a very big place. The first state house was made of brick and wood. There was little in the way of furniture and no carpet to ward against winter's chill. And they wanted to put carpets in there, but they couldn't afford to buy Brussels carpet, so they were expensive. So the governor of the state, who of course was uh, Thomas Worthington, invited the ladies to come down and maybe put together a carpet. So they said, sure, we'll do that. I don't, I don't know what it looked like. We don't have pictures of it or anything. And they presented it to him and gave it to him, and he was so happy with their efforts. You'd think, oh, well, he would give them something wonderful. Well, he did in, the, in ter their terms, but he gave them apples from his estate at Adena. Now, we might think that's funny, apples, but, you know, his estate was well known for its gardens, and apples were precious. Jarvis Pike, the first elected mayor of Columbus, cleared trees from the state house lawn. This uh, first capital was built with speed. There's a, an eyewitness account described the, the square as, as nine-tenths unoccupied, otherwise than as a pasture for cattle. In the 1830s, the canal system came. At nearly the same time, the National Road came through Columbus. Goods from Columbus and Franklinton could find their way to new markets. And the move of people was startling. German, Irish, Welsh, Jewish, Hungarian, even Russians came. But there were others too. Columbus and Franklinton took in wave after wave of Appalachian families. But there's a spirit here on the west side. It's a very fighting spirit, and I say that in a good sense of the word, that people are committed to the neighborhood. And uh, that's not a new phenomenon. There are people here that were very fiercely loyal. The neighborhood was always blue collar, and because it was subject to flooding, uh, it was a neighborhood that a lot of times, uh, some people at least tried to get out of, but others developed a very fierce attachment to it, and you could not pry them out to this day. Columbus, while dry near the banks of the Scioto, had patches of marshland from about 4th Street eastward. There was no sewage disposal, no access to pure water. Suddenly, 400 penitentiary inmates were stricken with cholera within a two-week period. The cholera hit Columbus in the 1830s, it hit it in the 1840s, especially bad when it was 1849, and it came back in 50, 51. It was just there. They didn't know what was causing it. People would be fine in the morning and they would die by the end of the day. People would get this look of concern on their faces and they would worry and they would settle up their affairs because they didn't know whether they were going to live through with this or not. Between disease and the rigors of travel, Columbus found itself with a new population to contend with, orphans. Hannah Neal, the wife of stagecoach king William Neal and proprietor of the Neal House, founded, along with several other ladies of the day, the Columbus Female Benevolent Society. They took in anyone who lost their parents and tried to help them out. And of course, the Hannah Neal, Hannah Neal mission, which has evolved over the years, it's still with us. If you were of the upper class, you might have supported the reformist movement that championed for humane institutions, namely the deaf school and lunatic asylum. If you were a city councilman, you'd meet at the mayor's tavern for business. If 
you were a Scioto boatsman, you'd prefer the jury room down by the river. And if you were a young boy out for trouble, you would stand on the banks of the Scioto and throw rocks at the lads over in the bottoms. By the time the first railroad came, Columbus was a thriving city. Although a new stone state house had been requested by the legislature, the financing came in dribs and drabs. Years went by. Um, what settles the question, ultimately, that we do need this new state capital is a fire. A fire that burns down that first state capital in 1852. It was arson. But the records are conspicuously vague about who might have said it. But what was clear is that fire was an ever-present danger for both Franklinton and Columbus. It was required by law that you keep a leather fire bucket in your home. When a fire broke out, everyone was required to bring their buckets. We weren't going to save the building that was on fire. They were trying to save the rest of the town uh, more than the structure that was on fire. There was a fire nearly every day of the year, some small, some big. One of the biggest took out eight buildings. While crews worked to complete the new state house, Columbus became only one of four cities in the nation with a paid fire department. There was about a five-year period where we started having paid men to do the job that the volunteers had been doing for free. The volunteers were kept on and they would get upset that they weren't getting paid and they would disband and then they'd reorganize and they'd disband and there was a lot of antagonism between the paid and fire departments. If you were a paid fireman, you worked seven days a week with only 12 hours off. You fed the horses and stoked the new steam engines that had to be hot 24 hours a day. Firehouses were built as far apart as a team of horses could pull the engine. Most folks were happy to help their neighbors. However, there was a rising contention on just what the definition of neighbor should be. African Americans in Ohio were free under the Northwest Ordinance, but that didn't mean the issue was settled. Ohio had black laws. If you were African American, you could be a barber, a waiter, a cook, or a maid, and that was about it. Remember, Columbus was a crossroads between the North and the South. Freedom was a relative term. While you are free here, the parameters around you are very, very tight. The freedom oftentimes was in danger because, yes, while there were a number of runaways coming through Columbus and sometimes they were caught and taken back, sometimes free people were taken. They were be mistaken as a runaway. Columbus can be proud of its contribution to the Underground Railroad, but it's important to remember that the majority of conductors here were not white. The conductors on the Underground Railroad in downtown Columbus were primarily African Americans. These black men and their wives were the principal conductors and station masters in downtown Columbus. The true picture of the Underground Railroad is that it was very, very dangerous and very illegal. This was business done by people who took great risks not only the risk of the runaway slave who knew if he or she got caught, the penalties would be extremely severe, but also for that underground railroad conductor, that agent, that station master. This is very, very, very dangerous times, and um, no one took it lightly. As the Civil War ultimately decided the issue of slavery, the mechanics of supporting the army left its mark on Franklinton, 
the home of Camp Chase. Right after the Civil War, uh, there were a lot of women who followed the troops around. There were many camp girls, as they were also known, who were just stranded here in the city with no means of support. And the city fathers didn't want this to become a haven for such. So they asked these nuns who were legendary, they were started in France, to come over here and open up a protectory. So they did. They ran an orphanage and a home for what were called wayward girls. And many of the girls were glad to get off the streets. They had a clean place to live. They were fed, cared for, and they learned what were considered the domestic arts of the day. No one knows when the bottoms became a derogatory term, but we do know it's been around a long, long time. That's the bottoms, that's the bottoms. And it's a nasty place to live and a bad place. And, and we really don't like people calling us the bottoms. Because the federal government financially supported the construction of the railroad during the Civil War, Ohio had one of the most sophisticated rail networks in the world. It meant that goods were cheap to ship and industry boomed. And the demand for coal as fuel created even more jobs. And you had to be within a, what they call the calling district. In other words, that's one reason people lived here in Franklin, because it was close to the railroad, it was close to their employment, because the call boy would come to your house and knock on the door and say, you're called for a train at such a time, or for a job at such a, such a time. Now, those people who had regular jobs reported to work every day you know, at a certain time. But on the railroad, it's not that way. You had lots of extras. You, you couldn't predict when a train was going to go to work. More freight tonnage moved through Columbus than any other city of its size. The biggest export? was buggies. The Columbus Buggy Company is important because they perfected the use of the assembly line in the construction of their buggies. And they were able to turn out enormous numbers of buggies very inexpensively. They became a major influence in American industry. A young Harvey Firestone visited the factories. Perhaps he took away inspiration on how to more efficiently make his new product, tires. The canal, the national road, and the trains also brought some memorable visits. Oscar Wilde stayed at the Neal House. Abraham Lincoln came not once, but three times. And who knows what O. Henry would have gotten into if he had not had so much time to write while serving time at our state penitentiary. If Columbus had startling success in one end of town, it struggled to fund a public library. We had a few libraries, but they were operated by subscription or were in private homes. If you were poor, or say Welsh or German, most likely you were not invited to join. So the idea of a facility that was open to anybody at any time was totally new. Well, when it was decided that we needed to have a freestanding library, of course, the person we turned to at that period in time was Andrew Carnegie, who funded libraries across the United States and even around the world. The application was straightforward, but we were turned down. But the main librarian at the time, a man named John Pugh, thought he could persuade Mr. Carnegie with a face-to-face -face meeting. And perhaps, in a gesture of friendship, Pugh chose to speak in a language Mr. Carnegie understood, Welsh. It worked. Mr. Carnegie financed the library and even made it fireproof. The Peter Pan Fountain came later. It was a father's tribute to his son. And he died at a very young age. He died of se at seven years old from scarlet fever. And his father wanted to build a memorial to George and to the children of Columbus. So they designed the fountain out front. Um, the artist chosen was May Cook, a local artist. 
May Cook was a friend of my dad's mother. My dad's mother was Rita. So one day, May says to Rita, I'm about to finish this sculpture, but I need one more look at a young boy's rear end. So Rita says to Dickie, said, well, Dickie's available. So my dad, of course, had a consent, so he presented his posterior to May, who put the finishing touches on the sculpture. Columbus was starting to look and feel like a big city. There was the financial district and the business district and grand government buildings. Theaters sprung up at State and High. It was the homes, like this one on Front Street, and these all along State Street, that kept the feel of a neighborhood even as the city grew. We also had a new class of people, the middle class, with something new to spend, time. Picnics were popular. So was shopping at Lazarus. A Columbus tradition was to attend dances at the Lunatic Asylum. A popular attraction was the new and grand state house. It's one of the more interesting aspects, of course, is the cupola that sits atop the Ohio State House. And, and of all the design elements of the State House, that was the most argued over, that particular uh, finishing touch. The cupola, that drum shape that we have on top, that is a true feature of Greek Revival architecture. Rich or poor, everyone used streetcars. I remember when uh, my dad would take, uh, would go, I think he would stand outside and wave and that's when they would you'd get on the streetcar. I don't think there was a such thing as, as a stop. You could go south to Green Lawn Cemetery or north to the new North Market. The North Market is the last of four original public markets that served all of Columbus back in the 1800s. We had the Central Market, which was really acknowledged as the granddaddy of all the Columbus public markets, which was located now where the current Greyhound bus station is. The building and the North Market district where we're currently housed here with the current North Market was the site of the original Old North Graveyard. We had all the amenities. We made the best ice cream. We made tools the world needed. We made shoes and saddles and artificial teeth. We were the largest producer of wrought iron anvils. We made more cement mixers and firefighting equipment than anywhere else in America. We had 800 manufacturing plants by the turn of the century. It's no wonder we became the test market for the nation. It's in our DNA. With success, of course, comes corruption. We didn't invent it, but we were pretty good at it. There was a, a lot of corruption back in the day. Uh, we think government is corrupt today. It was can't hold a candle to how corrupt it was back then. Um, there was a lot of uh, graft. There was a lot of kickbacks. There was a lot of bribery. Sensationalism sells, you know, big time crime sells. Uh, and so it was natural for the Dispatch and other newspapers of the day to focus heavily uh, on those things. Now, some newspapers, besides reporting uh, that sensational stuff, also were in the business, like the Dispatch, of trying to pressure city leaders to clean it up. Franklinton had trouble of its own. The river flooded badly every few years. Residents would clean up and start again. Some found strength at Holy Family Church. But Father Clark also, when he built this church, put in a window in honor of the Temperance Society. And it's the window uh, at the far corner that you can see on the camera. And it's dedicated to the Father Matthew Total Abstinence Society. But the Hibernians, an Irish group sometimes known for a little bit of drinking, they wanted to put a window in here too, and he obliged them, but he put it diagonal from the other window, so it's as far away from the temperance window as it can be, 
And the second thing that adds a little humor, it's right next to the confessional. This was uh, a poor neighborhood. And I think that's why Dr. Hawks and Dr. Hamilton started it here. And uh, they just gave us the building. And so we had three sisters who came here, and they had to go out and beg. They had to beg for uh, the things that we needed inside the hospital, any kind of medical equipment, beds, et cetera. The population felt it was a place to die, and they didn't want to go. They wanted to die at home like many of them do today. And so it wasn't the place where they wanted to go for care. because it was built as a hospital and um, they had private rooms and they had good food and they had a pharmacy. And so I think that, uh, you know, they had to prove themselves that, you know, you could go home, we did cure you and you could go home. Uh, Gladden was an outreach mission originally of First Congregational Church, which was right downtown at that time. And they saw a need on this side of the river because there was a lot of poverty, there were a lot of kids without any resources, supports, and so they started doing outreach programs for the kids, which grew into a full-blown social service agency. We really see ourselves as a family, as an extended family to the community. Um, the volunteers actually lived in the settlement house and worked in the settlement house. Um, so it was run by our volunteers that came in and lived there. The minister at that time was Reverend Washington Gladden, who was the most famous minister probably in the world at that time, minister of the social gospel. The social gospel rose out of the industrial age an age when children worked in factories and communities struggled to find clean drinking water. The social gospel said it wasn't enough to find personal salvation. You had to help others less fortunate in any way you could. Every, every Sunday, Dr. Gladden preached two different sermons. In the morning, he would preach on principles of the Christian life, and in the evening, he would preach on social teachings. And uh, the story goes that in the morning, most of the congregation gathered were women and uh, raising children and families. And in the evening, many civic leaders would show up and others from other churches would come. Many men would come to hear his Sunday evening sermons, which literally covered the gamut of different issues, everything from clean water to pure milk to streetcars to um, issues affecting coal miners. Washington Gladden was called Columbus's first citizen. In, in all honesty, he was a friend to the city. He was um, at, an irritant at times, but our real friends sometimes irritate us and call us to higher ground, right? But I think his, his love of Columbus, um, his, his passion for the city being the best possible city it could be, he calls for the city to care for its poorest, to build housing and water systems and uh, transportation systems that meet the needs of the poorest of the poor. And that's what he did for Columbus. When streetcar workers protested conditions that had them working literally years without one day off, Washington Gladden was in the thick of it. The 1910 streetcar strike was the most violent uprising the city had ever seen up to that time. Some businesses in Franklinton saw an opportunity and offered free rides to drum up business. As the weeks turned into months, the situation turned dangerous. Streetcars were blown up, businesses were paralyzed, and people in adjacent cities were afraid to venture in. Because it lasted so long, months, 
because it was so violent, because it involved the bringing in of the National Guard, was a really a traumatic event in this city's history and really changed the course in a way of how the city began to look at itself as a modern, new community. There are tenement houses, there are multiple prison sites, there are factories. It's not a pretty place to be, and there are a lot of people that really want the first view that anyone gets of Columbus coming along the National Road to be a stellar view, and it's anything but that. Columbus needed an image that matched its ingenuity. The City Beautiful movement arrived with Daniel Burnham, its most notable architect. He designed the Union Station and the Wyandotte Building. But clearly, more was needed. So there was a progressive sense in Columbus with civic-minded citizens, public leaders, uh, elected officials who were concerned about the quality of life in the city and trying to improve it and make it better. The result of this group's efforts was the 1908 plan that was released in February of 1908. Well, the 1908 plan defined Columbus as an industrial city, a state capital, and an education center and it challenged Columbus to become the most beautiful and well-ordered state capital in the country. The plan called for city parks, not only Franklin Park, but a park along the riverfront and parks for schools. The plan called for a trade school on the west side of the Scioto River. And it called for a grand civic mall that began at the State House and marched proudly over the river into Franklinton linking the past to the future. While many citizens had input into the plan, one man had the vision and experience to build it. Well, Frank Packard was a nationally recognized architect, Columbus architect. He practiced between the 1890s to the 1920s and designed about 100 buildings uh, in Columbus. He had a vision for his city. It was said that what Daniel Burnham did for Chicago, Frank Packard did for his city, Columbus. But before Frank Packard could build the city center he wanted, the unthinkable happened. In 1913, the worst flood in the history of Ohio ravaged Franklinton. 17 feet of water roared down the Scioto River. We had very heavy rain, and all the rivers were rising. We saw a mad, whirling rush of brown water. As we watched, the Broad Street Bridge slowly broke up and tumbled into the flood. Railroad embankments and buildings whose walls went down to the river's edge melted before us. When the flood came, the fire department uh, came and warned everybody in the bullhorn. Bullhorn, but a lot of people didn't believe it. And they refused to be warned as they stood in their homes and, and the, the water got the homes, put the house floated in the middle of the street, and the bodies were floating on McKinley Avenue. All the bodies were floating, refused to leave. They invited the surrounding people living in Franklinton to come and live at the hospital because uh, most of the houses were underwater at that time. And because we were so high, we, you know, we could take people in. It was an appalling sight. One has to see the horror 
and filth of a flood to see what it is. Later, someone laid on the floor the limp body of a child of about nine. But a boy or girl, one could not tell for the covering of mud. There's about 93 individuals that lost their lives and 4,000 homes that were destroyed in that flood. Um, Gliding Community House reached out and helped rebuild the community and offered a lot of relief through social programs. Everything had to be rebuilt. Every furnace and every building had to be redone because everything was ruined. There were lots and lots of fires because the gas lines ruptured and caused fires. There was no firefighting. Even with all that water, things were burning down. It was a disaster. It was, obviously, they lost probably 99% of everything they owned. Uh, but it was uh, still that persevering attitude that, uh, you know, uh, we'll go back and rebuild and, and uh, start over. The Corps of Engineers widened the river. Look along the railroad trestle just north of Broad Street. Where the two different trestles meet is where the riverbank used to be. The Corps worked to make the river safe, while city leaders took the opportunity to push the city center forward. So, led by Frank Packard, Robert Wolf, who was the editor of the Dispatch, and covered in his cartoon, The Passing Show, Billy Ireland, start promoting the idea of the Civic Center to be developed along the riverfront, a grouping of public buildings, and then a park, Victory Park. Frank Packard and Robert Wolf worked behind the scenes. Billy Ireland, though, nudged city leaders to finance a new look for Columbus in a very public way. Billy Ireland passionately cared about his community. Um, and I think it's that love of place that really shows up in, in his work. Over the next few decades, both public and private buildings began to transform downtown. Columbus began to capture the attention of the nation. A great city that had arrived, a city that that was, you know, up and coming, a city that, that was going to be part of the nation. It needed a great art museum. The thought that we need to teach and expose young people to, to the arts, to, to, the, to, the, to the great achievements of the, of the human race. That's what people were thinking. Because, you know, we knew the Columbus Museum was never going to be the biggest museum in the world, but what we wanted was that quality, that very special feeling when you're here, that sort of, intimacy and yet grandeur. Frederick Schumacher gave us his collected masters. Ferdinand Howold, a mining engineer, gave us early modernists. Howard and Babette Sirak gave us the impressionists. The very first painting the museum bought? Well, that was a group effort. And right around the same time we bought our first American painting, we bought it by subscription which is everybody throws in their nickels and their, you know, their quarters and everything. And as a community, we bought a great Robert Henry painting. The crowning jewel of the city was our first skyscraper. Outside of Manhattan, it was the tallest building in the United States at the time. It's 555 and a half feet tall, just taller than the Washington Monument, done purposefully this rebirth of the city. It's this white shining tower on the hill, proverbial. There's images of suns and moons on the lintels that face Front Street. You see the Greek deities of life on one side and the Greek deities of death on the other. At the very top of the tower, there used to be giants and in one arm holding a child and the other arm holding a child saying, the AIU will protect you. It had its own radio station, WAIU. It had an observation deck where you could look out and, and see the rest of the city. 
It's an amazing building. It's Columbus saying, here we are, look at us. This is where we're going to be. This is what we can do. And Franklinton? Well, for all the heartbreak the floods brought, Franklinton, too, had a lot of successes. We make chocolates. We make box chocolates. Buttercreams, caramels, nougats, cherries, English toffee, pecan dainies, all those types of chocolates. One time we had two movie theaters, uh, the Dixie Theater and the Avondale Theater. Tommy's, Milo's, Phillips Coney Island. And Lily Farrow took over what would become the oldest Harley-Davidson dealership in the nation. Uh, she was a grand lady. She was an enthusiast who ran races on the weekend. Uh, she was a, a part of the early history of women's motorcycling, the motor maids, and uh, racing was always great fun. Uh, her role was absolutely unique. It was unprecedented for a woman to be doing what she was doing. Until the flood wall was completed, Franklinton couldn't revitalize because there were too many building restrictions. For a very long time, this neighborhood was, was pretty much frozen in time, at least from a property value point of view, from a business development point of view. There are a lot of investment landlords waiting for the surge in property values. That's one reason why you see so many boarded up houses. But there are plenty of streets that are starting to turn around. And when we had our commission election in 1974, uh, 600 people came out and voted, not only for the commission, but they voted to change the name back to Franklinton. Because we have the flood wall to protect us now, so we have to worry about being the bottom, we're Franklinton. We're actually purposely trying to create some housing uh, through rehab and new construction of bigger buildings or smaller buildings that artists can use to live in and work in. We started doing events like this five, six years ago with the Frank, you know, when we formed the Frankenton Arts District. It's really helped bring awareness to the neighborhood. Well, our, our mission itself as Frankenton Gardens is uh, number one, to grow and share healthy food. And that's because uh, Franklinton itself currently doesn't have a grocery store. Well, Franklinton has so many great things about it, warehouse space, a great street grid. In the years to come, Franklinton is going to be the place to be and the place to see. As for Columbus, let's go back to that formula. We're an industrial city, we're a state capital, and an education center. All three have meant jobs and economic diversity. And from there, we've only grown. Uh, manufacturing has never been uh, a major sector of Central Iowa's economy. It's been an economy made up primarily of uh, government, of higher education, of research and development, of retail, of uh, wholesaling and uh, distribution, wholesale distribution. Uh, no sector of the economy has generally accounted for more than about 20% of the overall Central Ohio economy. And so that balance uh, means that if something's going bad in one sector of the economy, it doesn't tank the whole economy. We were able to withstand the Great Depression and thrive in the years after World War II. That success attracted industry and allowed for our existing companies to thrive. All of that attracted more people. A forward-thinking annexation program meant even more stability. Columbus is the largest city in population and land area in the state of Ohio. Which means that our neighborhoods, all of them, have been able to keep their quirks and personality. Our neighborhoods are what living in Columbus is all about.
Downtown is a unique case. Has it been perfect? No. We've been suburbanized and scrutinized. It's another milestone in the attempt to save the Ohio Theater. We're all fired up and we're just going to do it for Central. The last guys. We still haven't figured out parking in downtown. There's a huge missing piece, and that's a transportation piece. Transportation, more than any other single decision, transportation shapes the way a metropolitan area looks and functions. We've torn down and pushed forward. And I think we're seeing a, a big pent-up demand for living in downtown. It'll never be a majority of people, but all you need is a, is a significant minority to have a very, very vibrant urban core. Columbus is well-placed for continued both social as well as economic growth. The future of Columbus looks very, very bright. We're at a point in time where it's important for the world to know how great we really are and for us to know it more than anybody else. I love Columbus. I love Columbus. I love Columbus. I love Columbus because we're the perfect blend of urban culture and Midwest values. It's such a beautiful city. It's collegiate atmosphere and vibrant arts community make me feel young. You don't have to be that old blue blood. You don't have to be the old money to make an impact in our city. This is an extraordinary town. And one of the things I like about Columbus is how quickly you can get involved. You want to, you don't want to join a board, do you want to be a, do you want to, you know, get involved? How do you want to get involved? I think that's gonna take us a long way in the 21st century. I really do. I love Columbus. Living here, I can walk to parks, the theater, art galleries. I think it's a very manageable and a very livable city. I'm very proud of and I love the um, distinctive character of the historic neighborhoods. We love Columbus because of the parks. And the bike paths. And the festivals. And the arts. And the dam. And the, the food. food. We love Columbus because it's a great place to raise a family. Columbus realizes that uh, in order to have a great city, you have to have great traditional architecture, and it adds texture to that city. As a freelance writer, I've always been able to find work here, have made some wonderful friends, and I'm never bored. I love the city of Columbus because there's adventure around every corner. We love Columbus because of the awesome downtown art scene. A city, I think we're rather understated, somewhat humble, somewhat polite, I love the city of Columbus because of all the great organizations doing lots of great work with the youth. Columbus is a uh, passionate, creative, and independently spirited community. Columbus has rich history. The state of Ohio has rich history. Every day I'm always finding something that I didn't know before in this town. Whether it's the Gay Pride Parade or all the arts festivals, everybody's welcome, so come on down. I'm a city girl who likes to escape to the country. Go 40 minutes in any direction here and you've got a vacation at home. I like Columbus because of our cultural diversity and our ability to think outside of the box. I love Columbus because it is a big city with a small town feel. I love Columbus because of all these unique neighborhoods that I've lived in. Washington Gladden's commitment to friendship, I think, is still alive and well in Columbus today. It's through our friendships and that sense that we can contact another to make a difference uh, that Columbus can overcome everything. It truly is the greatest city in the nation, the best people in the world. I love Columbus because it's my neighborhood.
Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... Since 1921, the State Auto Group has called Columbus Neighborhoods home, offering personal and business insurance through independent insurance agents. For your car, home, and business, the State Auto Group. As we've grown and changed with Columbus, we've never lost sight of one thing. We are neighbors serving neighbors. Chase and its more than 15,000 Central Ohio associates are proud to celebrate the historic neighborhoods of Columbus. AEP Ohio, connected to your life. More at aepohio.com. The law firm of Bailey Cavalieri, a local firm with a national presence, baileycavalieri.com. And by these and other local foundations and families, and viewers like you, thank you. Columbus Neighborhoods Downtown in Franklinton is available on DVD. Log on to WOSU.org forward slash shop for details.